Okay. So this is what the, the layout for CS3. Um, the layout will change, I won't say a lot, but it does change a bit for CS4. Instead of seeing this as, as individual elements, seeing your toolbar to the left, um, seeing your um, properties panel separated at the bottom, and all of your palettes to the right, they'll all be one unified um, panel or, or unit that will go together. Um, very similar to what you see here, but arranged slightly differently. <coughs> and the key thing that's missing at the moment will be the timeline. And when we create a new file, then you'll see where that, that lies, um, where that can be arranged. So at the moment, I'm going to go ahead and just create a new flash file. And Why did you give that as the timeline? OK, this didn't show up here. OK, somebody probably clicked on here that said, don't show again. And that can be changed. We can go back up to um, yeah, flash, should be preferences. And let's unlaunch. We have the welcome screen. Let's see. Do you see welcome screen or not? What does it show on yours? Huh? Oh, in the drop down. Oh, okay. Does it say, can welcome. you select welcome? Oh, okay. okay, close. close um, if you do not see this, <coughs> which is the welcome screen, then go ahead and when you have the preference folder up, there's a drop down window and make sure that it's checked. Close flash, open it back up, and that should be visible. It's not a bad thing to have open. Because you can open from the left-hand column, recent documents. You can create new documents um, either from ActionScript 3 or 2. Um, there's a variety of other things. You can create ActionScript files from here. You can also create new documents from templates, which we will do a little bit later. And you'll also see down below here, it'll say there's the Flash Exchange. That's something that I didn't use last semester and we should use more of this time. It's Adobe Flash Exchange. Because <coughs> there's a lot of help, helpful files, a lot of helpful tools, that sort of thing that you can have access to from the Adobe website. Okay. So did, did it work for you that time? Okay. Everybody else? Okay. Good. Let me get this little nuisance thing done. I don't want to cancel that. There we go. Okay, so if we're ready to create a brand new document, just for the heck of it, I'm going to click here in the middle where it says Create New Document Flash File Action Script 3. Click OK, and you'll notice a brand new window pops up right in the middle of our document. And it's taken a minute, I don't know why. I hope it doesn't crash. There we go. Okay, we're good. Good to go. Is this what everybody else got? What, what all of you got? Okay, good. And that's that's what we want. <coughs> Okie doke. So let's cover the all the all of the the windows and panels and properties that we have here, so you can see what's going on. Over to the left, and you can move this wherever you like. But these are all of your tools, and this is what I would like to cover today. These are basic drawing tools over here. Drawing circles, ellipses, paths, things like that, okay? It has nothing to do with bringing in photographic images. It has nothing to do with bringing in sound. It has nothing to do with any of those other things. It's just creating basic shapes that you will use to, you know, use to design your, your document, okay? If you're interested in traditional 2D animation, and you want to create characters using these drawing tools, they're no different than any other drawing tools that you would find in Illustrator or Photoshop. So it's, I'm not, uh, uh, 
there are some unique properties about them that you have to know about, and that's what I want to cover because it's different. Although this is a vector program, it behaves in many respects like a bitmap program, but it's not, which may not may or may not make sense, but it will when I show you. At the bottom, we have the properties panel, which is extremely important. Um, you'll notice this if you've used any Macromedia product, that when you click, um, let me click on properties here, let's make sure that the properties is selected. And when I, it, since nothing is selected at the moment, and I click on the stage or the background, it gives me a lot of useful information about it. <coughs> if I were to collect, select the rectangular tool, it gives me useful information about the rectangle tool. If I were to select the free transform tool, it gives me a lot of useful information about it. So whatever tool is selected, even if it's just the background, if I come back to here and I click background, it gives me a lot of useful information. Um, it tells me, for example, that the document is untitled, Okay, that this is a flash file. It gives me the, st the size, which is 550 by 400 pixels. And if I wish to go to the publish settings, I can go to file, and I can go to publish settings up here, or I can simply get to them from the properties panel. I can click right on here and get to the same place, which we will do shortly. Um, it, I can change the background color of my stage from here. So if I decide that I want this kind of a light orange or peachy kind of color, notice that that changes from there. Also, when you click on the, um, the color picker, notice that it gives you, remember I was talking about web safe colors last week? That's exactly what all of these colors are. They're the 216 web safe colors. And when you move over any of them, you'll see the hexadecimal number right here, okay, associated with it, okay? Oh, come on, there we go. It also, to the right, gives you the frame rate. Um, traditionally, for the web, <coughs> but things have changed, let's see. For CDs, um, animation traditionally was about 15 frames per second, um, as well as the web. Maybe the web could have dropped to 10 or 12 frames per second. Film is 24 frames per second. Video is 30 frames per second, so on and so forth. Um, what we will be using in this class, or what I recommend that we use, is 20 frames per second. Why 20 frames, you ask? Um, is that when you look at the timeline here, you'll notice that it's broken down into five frame increments. It's just easier to calibrate time when you use 20. If I need something that's two seconds, then I know that that's frame 40. If you use 24 frames per second, which is what film is, then okay, two times 24 is 48, and where is 48 here? It's 50 minus two. It just takes you a little bit longer to find those points in time. And for the web, 20 frames per second is just fine. <coughs> um, although you may, whatever frame rate, rate you put here, um, when you publish it and the end user plays it, it's not that it will necessarily play it at that rate, it will try to play it at that rate. That is determined by the processor speed of the end user's computer and how much they have going on. If it can't play it at 20 frames per second, it'll then start to drop frames. And then you'll notice a bit of a stuttering. Okay. To do it any more than that really is pointless. To try to do 30 frames per second, which is true video, it doesn't make sense. If you're gonna publish this to video, then it does make sense. If this is going to be converted to film, then do it to 24 frames per second. But it, for us, since these are going to be viewed on the web, 20 frames per second is just fine. Okay. You'll notice it's telling us that this is set for player nine. Actually, the most current player version, I believe, is 10. Um, ActionScript three, and the profile for this is default. 
And you can also click in here if you want and write a document class if we want. But that just gave us tons of information without having to go anywhere else. Now, when it talks about the stage size, that's what this wide area is right here. And you'll notice the workspace here shows that I'm showing it at 100%, so this should be the size that would be viewed online. Can this be changed? It can be changed whenever you want. <coughs> My recommendation is, though, that you know the stage size and you stick to it from the onset. If you reduce it later on and you have to move elements on your stage, it can, be get, it can become very tricky because you have not just a single point in time, you have multiple frames over time that have to be moved. Does that make sense? When we get to um, making changes to your scene over multiple frames, you know, editing multiple frames, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, it may not make any sense at the moment, or it maybe it sort of makes sense intellectually, but when you actually get involved in it, it can become tricky, and you can really mess up your whole project having it, by changing the stage size afterwards. It's not that it's not doable, it's just that it takes a lot of work. So it's, it's really best if you determine a stage size at the very onset, the very beginning. Some of the other things that um, you can change at any time, I mentioned you can change the background color. But the problem with that is, um, is that you can only have one background for your entire project. You can't have a background for frame, one color background for frame one, and then a separate background color for frame 100. It doesn't work that way, or a separate scene, or a separate whatever. It can only be one background color. So you have to sort of fake it. You have to put a rectangle over the background or something like that that makes it look like a different background, but in fact there's an object there that's ch changing the color of it. You can only have one frame rate for the entire project. You can't have multiple frame rates, which you could in Director. You could have a different frame rate for every frame if you wanted to. And that too will mess up your project if you change it because if you determine that <coughs> an object goes across the stage in two seconds based on 20 frames per second, and then down the road you change it to 15 frames per second for that point in your project, then it's also affected this, and it's going to either go back, it'll go across quicker, or no, slower. I forget, whatever. You'll see a difference. It doesn't, okay? So does that make sense to everybody? So again, there's your stage, and up here is your timeline. And many of the same features are available up here that you see down here. For example, you'll see right in the middle, this is 20 dot FPS, 20 frames per second. So not only do you see it here, you see it here. So you can see this multiple places. We can also go to modify document, and we'll see the same properties up here. Here's our dimensions, the dimensions of our document. Here's the background color, here's the frame rate. If you want the ruler visible, it will be in pixels. Now, <coughs> you cannot do this here, but you can do it at home. And if you like this, this stage size, and you like the frame rate, and you like the background color, you can click Make Default. And then the next time you open it, it will automatically have that stage size, that frame rate, that background color. That's the default that you use. If you try to do that here, it won't work because remember, every time you shut down the computer, um, Deep Freeze resets the computer for the original settings that it had. So it's going to go back to the original frame rate that was the default frame rate, which is could be 12 frames per second or something. I don't know. What are you guys showing on your? Is it? You see? Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, that's fine. But that's what the default frame rate is, is 12 when you launch the application. And if I want to get to that place, instead of going to modify, I can double click on 20 frames per second and it brings that up too. So typically there's three, four different ways of doing the same thing. 
I can change many of the, the properties from here. I can click here, you know, double click here, and that will bring that up, or I can go to modify document or command J, and that will get me the same place. But anyway, this is your timeline. And um, for the moment, we only have one layer. And uh, if you've worked with Photoshop or Illustrator or any other program that has layers, it works in a very similar fashion. Um, you have one default layer, and as you add layers, it typically the layer that's at the top is at the top of the, the stacking order. And all the other layers <coughs> are, are beneath this layer. Okay. Um, lots of other tools that we'll be using he here. You'll notice um, a little button here if we want to insert layers. We can add another layer from here. See how I'm adding layers? We also can add a motion guide layer, and this is something that has changed in CS4. Um, so when it is installed, I will address that further. If you want to create folders to um, place specific group of la layers, you can do that. And then here's your little trash can to delete layers. <coughs> this little um, red icon here refers to the, pl the, the playhead. We can also view onion skinning. Does everybody um, know what that is pertaining to, to animation? Onion skinning allows you to see back in time. So if, you, if you're working on a frame-by-frame frame animation, for example, and you're working on frame five with onion, onion skinning, it'll look like you're looking through pieces of tracing paper and you can see back in time. It's similar to what the traditional animators, the way that they have worked. Um, I don't know how they do it, but they typically um, you know, will have like about four or five sheets in one hand and they can flip through them and they'll be able to see through each of those pieces of tracing paper and be able to see the motion, you know, about five, five steps. You can make the onion skinning for as many steps as you want, as little as two steps and as many as all frames if you want, but it gets a little bit unnerving if it's more than five. <coughs> we can also see onion skin, but only as outlines rather than the individual images. This is similar to onion skinning, but when we get to editing multiple frames, that will be the tool that we'll be using. This one here is modifying the onion skinning markers, and you'll see that when you have multiple onion skins visible, we can modify just select frames, and that's what that's for. The next one tells us what frame we're on, which is frame one right here. And as I mentioned, this is the frame rate, and this is the Optim or, or the, the time that's passed. Okay, and then we can see over here. We can see that we have our workspace. <coughs> we can um, edit various scenes from here. We can the next one. We can edit symbols from here, which we'll talk about later. Symbols will become very important in Flash. And this is the size that we're viewing the stage at 100%. If you want to zoom in. There's lots of different tools. We have the zoom tool, just like Photoshop, or we can click from here and we can specify, I wanna see it at 200%, or I can come back here and I go back to 100%, okay? And over to the right are our palettes. We have our color palette, we have our swatches, very similar to what you would see in Illustrator or Photoshop. We have our history palette, we have an align palette, we have an info, we have scenes if you want. Scenes are equivalent to separate pages, HTML pages. Um, all of this is customizable. If there are a specific group of palettes that you use frequently, um, you can customize this and save it. We could go to window and we can go to um, Hold on here. I gotta remember where the heck it is here. Oh, come on. Where is it? Oh, properties. Where are you? It's probably down here. Workspace. There we go. It's down here. 
And you'll notice I have from last semester saved Kirk's workspace. And when I select that, it'll switch real quick, and you'll notice the, the, my desktop or the layout looks totally different. How do you m manipulate this? Is that you just drag the panels or the windows wherever you want them, go to Window, um, come down here to Workspace, and just um, save current, and it will ask you to give it a name. So you can have multiple um, settings for your workspace and customize it to whatever workflow suits you. If I don't like this and I think it looks cluttered and I want to go back to the default, I just simply go to Workspace and go back to Default. And I've got it. And it cleans up your workspace. Wouldn't it be nice to clean your office or your home like this? It's strange that it doesn't work that way, though, huh? Okay. So that is sort of the lay of the land. That's how it's organized. <coughs> now, what Flash is used for? It's typically used to publish animation or interactive <coughs> projects on the web. It does not have to be used on the web, but that was the original intent. Okay. And as I mentioned a moment ago, I said your original file formats will be .fla. The ones that you publish for the web will be .swf. And I use that term carefully, publish, because in order to <coughs> use the document for the web, you have to take your, your, your project that you've created and publish it. And there are a variety of settings that you can use that we'll get to in a minute under publish settings that can be published any number of different ways. So let's do that now. Let's go to file. And let's go to publish settings. <coughs> And we'll see that we have lots of options. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Under formats, we see three different tabs here: formats, flash, and HTML. Formats, type. Okay, the page type we want is HTML, and the flash will be .swf. I don't care right now about QuickTime um, or pings or JPEGs, but you can publish individual frames as GIFs or JPEGs or PNGs or whatever, if you wish. The, there are two checkboxes that I think are worth noting, though. You'll see that there's a Windows projector and a Macintosh projector. This will be especially, I think, useful to many of you who wish to create a, um, a pre not only a presence on, a we on the web and have your portfolio visible as a flash project. So you have this really nice slideshow. But you may want to um, carry that around on either a flash drive or a CD. And what if you wanted to give a portfolio over to a client? And maybe they don't have flash. Okay, So how would they view it? The um, best way to do it is, you know, they had a, have a computer with a CD-ROM drive, but you, they would, if it was saved as a projector, a projector is a self-contained application. So as long as it has all the files that it needs, you just double-click on that application, whether it's for a Macintosh or the PC, it's self-contained and they can view it. It's pretty cool. Because there are a lot of clients that don't have Flash. And <coughs> it may, they may not have an internet connection. You know, it, you might be meeting at a restaurant or something, and th there's no internet connection, but you have your laptop with you. So you pop in the CD and. What application is it? Huh? What application it's, a, it's its own application. It's a projector. You just double click on it, you just double click, you double click on the CD to open it. You'll see the projector file, double click on it, and it's totally self contained. So it's very, very nice. So what you may do when you publish it, you'll publish it as an SWF file. You may also want to publish it, that SWF file contained in an HTML, because in order to view Flash on the web, it has to be in an HTML document. You may also want to publish it at the same time as a Windows and Macintosh pr projector. 
And then what you would do is you'd take each of these projectors and burn them on a CD. So you could, doesn't matter what platform the person has, they would only be able to open one or the other. Double click on it and, and play it, and it would be fine. They don't need flash, they do not need, um, they don't need flash player, they don't need anything. It's totally self-contained. So that's going to save that <coughs> all those different Correct, all those files. different file formats. So wherever you tell it to save, and typically where flash saves these files is wherever the FLA file is saved. Wherever that's saved, it will publish these files in addition to it. So you'll see a whole list, just like we saw the Photoshop files the other day that you would see the same file name with all the separate extensions, it will be the same here. You'll see whatever file name you've assigned to it with all these separate extensions next to it. Okay. This is very cool and this is something that Director had as well. You could create them as, as projectors. I think that's what they called it with Director as well, but they're totally, those files are completely, they're actually, it's a part of an application that's completely self-contained. <coughs> Actually, if you want to put it in Final Cut Pro, you'd probably save it as a QuickTime movie. Because Flash in recent years has become very powerful as a, as a vid for video. There's Flash video, and that's something I hope we, get, we definitely want to get to. Because there's lots of nice little um, skins for them that you can use that once you put created it that it will attach a skin to it so you can have, you know, the play and the stop and the rewind and adjust the sound and that sort of thing and it's all built in. It's very nice. <coughs> That's wait, 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 go ahead. Which? These? Oh, okay, we're gonna we'll get to that. These are just these. I'm gonna turn these off. Let's go to flash. Now, this has to do with which, which Flash Player, and at this time, Flash Player 9 was the most recent. It tells you what load order do you want. When it says bottom up, it refers to the layers. Just leave it in the default. <coughs> ActionScript version, I set this up as a file for ActionScript 3, but if you feel more comfortable working backwards in ActionScript 2 or 1, you can work backwards, but then it, remember if you go backwards it won't open it and you've used ActionScript 3 it'll be non-functional. So be careful what you're doing here. <coughs> you have all of these other options too. You can generate size reports. For those of you who are really concerned about people stealing your work, um, protect from import, click on that. And people will only be able to view it as a flash project. They will not be able to download it. Um, omit, omit trace actions, permit debugging, all of these things are nice to be able to check. If you want to password protect this, you can do that. And type in, you know, uh, we can do that so you can type in, you know, edit the password. That would, that's very nice. Um, you can also control the JPEG quality in the default setting is 80, which is good. And also, we can override the sound settings here, and right now you'll see that they're, it's set for mono, and it's, they're MP3, six kilobytes per second. If you want better quality, that can be changed. If you want to reduce quality, that can be changed too. Uh, we're just, in this class, we just leave all, most of these all the default settings. But there's a lot that you can change. And again, when you select HTML, again, template, Flash only, you want to detect, this is important too, you might want to de detect the Flash version. If it's important that you set it backwards com so that you want it backwards compatible, you can do that. Dimensions of the HTML page, maybe you want it to match the movie so you don't have this big page with this little piece floating in it. Does that make sense? The big page with a little project. And again, quality, window mode, HTML alignment, you can leave all of these. Right now I'm just leaving all these the default, but there's lots and lots of, of settings. Notice where it says dimensions match movie, and it's basing that on the 550 by 400 pixel stage size that we have. <coughs> 
So these are all of your published settings. Okay. And you can publish from here, we can publish from here, we can publish from up here, we can publish from a variety of different places. Okay. There's all sorts of things that can be customized in here. If you want to customize key commands, if you want to use Photoshop key commands instead of Flash key commands, you can do all of that. Okay. There's all sorts of things that you can customize in here. I'm going to go back to 100%. And what I would like to do is to start to show you how to use the tools. If you think, unless there's more, you I mean, are we okay with this for the moment, at least for the moment? Because the tools get a little bit wonky, some of them. Okay? We can always go backwards, but I just wanted to give you the lay of the land and then move forward with this. Okay, so I'm going to start. <coughs> uh, I'm going to pull this off for a moment so you can see this. Hold on here. There we go. Okay, similar to other drawing programs, we have our tools that allow us to move the object. We have our move tool or a selection tool, or a direct selection tool. And here it's called a sub-selection tool. We have our free transform tool. We have our lasso tool, which allows us to select objects. So this first group allows us to select or and or move objects that we create. The next group are our drawing tools. <coughs> So we have a pen tool, similar to what you would have in Illustrator, but I don't think it works as well. So, and you'll, we'll sort of do a little bit with it, but my recommendation is if you really like to use the pen tool, create your project in Illustrator and export it as an SWF file, and then import it into Flash, and you'll have a much better drawing. Okay, that's my, my thoughts on that. Text tool, you'll use a lot. Okay, similar to what you would use in Photoshop or Illustrator. We'll get to that too. Although there are additional features because there, we will start by using static text, but there's also dynamic text and input text. So you have those other additional properties that will be available as well. Simple linear strokes. We have our basic rectangle tool, oval or ellipse tool. Um, the rectangle primitive tool, oval primitive tool, and polystar tool, which is a polygon tool, which can also be used to create star-like shapes as well. So these are like primitives in 3D modeling. We have our pencil tool, which is a free form drawing tool, and we have our brush tool, okay, which is nice big blobby shapes. We'll get to more of that in a minute too. Now, these are the draw tools. The next are the tools that allow us to control the fill, the stroke, to um, control color, to erase, to move, to zoom in. These are basically our modification tools. <coughs> okay, we have the ink bottle. The ink bottle will control the stroke color. The fill bucket will control the fill of the shape. shape. The eyedropper allows you, if you've forgotten what color you, you've used and you want to suck it up and put it in either the ink bottle or the paint bucket, it allows you to do that. The eraser tool, which has now been integrated into Illustrator. If any of you have used Illustrator CS3, they now have an eraser tool. That was new and that was they integrated that only because they, they purchased Macromedia. That was a, a, a tool that didn't exist before in the Adobe Thing, and you'll see why it's unique. Hand tool, what you might just might think, it allows you to, you know, move, click and drag and move the stage around. So that I, if I can move it over to the side, I can and I can work off stage if I wish or, you know, just move to a different part of the stage. And the zoom tool, similar to what we have here. You click and wherever you click, you zoom in and it centers it. Hold down the option key and it zooms back out. Whoops. And you click and drag again and it zooms out. 
If you want to reset, just go back from here, 100%. And spacebar should get you to the hand tool, and then we go back. The next tools down here allow you to control the stroke color. The one beneath it allows us to control the fill color. And again, you can we can use the color picker or the sliders, or I can click on the tab and I have my hexadecimal number. Hex my web safe colors. Um, if I wish to flip the foreground with a background color, or rather the the stroke with the, the fill color, I can do that here. It swaps from here. If I don't want a stroke color or I don't want a fill color, I can select here. And then this is one of the newer features here. This allows me to enlarge. That's from here. So this gives us specific tools to whatever we've selected here. Let me come back and select the rectangle tool. Okay. You'll notice that we have this little checkbox down here, and this is important. Okay, this allows us to use object drawing, and this is where it, just sit back and watch, and then you guys try it when I'm done. Okay, if I deselect it, then we're using shape objects, and then the magnet um, tool just might what you think it would be snap to objects when you draw, so it helps to align much quicker if you want. If you don't want that on, you turn it off, and then it's no longer grayed. It's just white. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, so just watch because this gets a little weird. I'm gonna um, let me start this way. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna select no stroke, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna select a green fill. And I have my rectangle tool, and I have the object drawing turned off and I'm going to click and drag to make my rectangle. Ta-da, click and drag. And I release the mouse and I have my rectangle. I'm done with it, I'm ready to move it, or resize it, or change some attribute of it. Does that make sense? It's similar to what you would do in, in Photoshop or Illustrator. You select <coughs> the selection tool to make those changes. If I select once, if I click once on this, You'll notice how it changes. You see this slight dot pattern? It's called a selection mesh. Does everybody see that? And it allows me to click and drag and to move it. If you don't see it, I need to know. When you do it yourself, you will see it. Okay? When I turn when I move off of it and I click off of it, it disappears. It's important to notice what that looks like. Something else that's unique about it, too, is that you'll notice that when I move over the edge, notice how the cursor changes. You'll see that there's a slight little arc in the lower right-hand corner. Remember, although this clicks and it behaves, and it is, um, a vector object, it allows you to edit it in weird ways that, it, that are unique to Flash. At least they have been unique to Flash but are now being integrated into Illustrator. If I move over the edge, I can click and I can drag and I can change its properties. C couldn't do that in Illustrator. You had to select it, select an anchor point, change the handles, drag them, da 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 and it goes on and on. So that allows you to do that. I can come back and I can move it in and I can do that with each of these. You know, I can move it in, you know, pull it out. So before you know it, you've got a considerably different looking shape, don't you? I'm hitting Command Z on the PC, it would be Control Z to undo. And by default, you have, I think, 10, 20 undos, something like that. And it's like Illustrator, you can add to that. You can have as many as maybe 200 undos or something like that. So let's go ahead and make another rectangle over here. Okay, and it will behave the same way. You select it, you see the selection mesh, you move over the edge when it's not selected and you can manipulate it. But this is where it changes, where it's not like Illustrator. Well, these are separate objects. Watch what happens when I overlap them and I deselect and then I reselect. It's one object now. 
So if they are like color and they are shape objects, meaning that I see that selection mesh and I overlap them and they're on the same layer and I deselect them, they join together. Can you show me some overlap? No, um, yes. And I'll show you how you control that. I'm, that's why I, I purposely, when I created this, I turned off the shape object. Because this is the old version, and you may want that because um, maybe you want to create a shape that's like this. Why? You know, how would you do that? Would you use the pen tool? Would you select them both? And then in Illustrator, you might use the Pathfinder tool to join them together. There's a variety of ways. Well, this makes it more efficient. What if I wanted to poke a hole or I wanted to cut a, an arc out of this? There's another way we can do that. And let, instead, let's go ahead and select the oval tool. And I'll click and I'll drag. Um, although I don't, let's go ahead and since I already made it, what I can do is I can now select it to edit it. I can click on, there's a variety of ways that I can change the fill color. I can click from here and let's make it red. And while it's selected, it's now becomes red, right? That's one way of doing it. Another way, while it's deselected, might be to s select the fill bucket. <coughs> Go ahead and click on change the fill color, and let's make it more of a, you know, a lavender or purple kind of click. And click on here, and that changes it too. So you can do that. And now, because all of these are on the same layer, and I move this over the edge like so, and I deselect, and now I decide I want to move the circle and I select it and I move it, notice what happens. So when it's a different color, it actually functions as a cookie cutter, as an eraser, and moves it away. So is that good? If, you, if that's what you intend and you wanted this shape, which under normal circumstances with the, the usual tools would take a while to do. And it would be difficult to be this, make it that arc that perfect. It can be a really, it can be a useful way to draw. It really can. But it can be a real nuisance if you forget about it, and you accidentally move a shape on top of another that's going to either join it together, or it's going to, if there are different colors, it's going to be a cookie cutter and cut it apart. So how do you avoid all of this, if that's your purpose, and you want them all on the same layer? The best approach would be to use the shape object, or not shape objects, would be to use the, um, what do they call it now? I can't even remember myself. It, they call it dr a drawing object. And it looks a little bit different. Um, if you want to erase the whole stage, double click on the eraser tool. Actually, before I erase, I'm going to show you something. Um, again, with the eraser tool selected, you can see that we have um, erase normal, Erase just fills, which is interesting. Erase just lines. Erase selection fills. Erase inside. Lots of options that you need to pay attention to. So for example, <coughs> this is what's, what's kind of cool about this. I can select this, or I can use the inkwell, and I decide I want a one-point solid line, or maybe I want a six-point solid line. I can come over the edge, and I can add my stroke to this, okay? Now I decide, you know what, I wanted to erase part of the inside of this. Well, in Illustrator, you, it, before CS3, you couldn't do that because it's a separate object. You either had the object or you don't. It's that simple. It's not bitmap by, you know, it's not pixel by pixel. However, with the eraser tool selected, I can select and I can just say erase normal and watch, I'll click across here and I've now cut this in two pieces. I can also select from here, and you'll notice that with the paintbrush to the tool, there's similar features here. What if I just want to erase fills? Watch when I cl click across here now. It only erased the fill and it left the stroke. So lots of features that you can use to your advantage. Erase lines. Make sense? So there's lots of variations on this. But what's kind of interesting about this, though, is 
if I erase normal, and I would just want to erase kind of a weird kind of approach to this, it's this irregular shape, I can do that. This is still vector, and I can come back with a direct selection tool, and you'll notice it still has the anchor points. Notice the anchor points in here, that each of these are editable. I can come back and I can select them. Now, I find the tools in here to be quite awkward. To try to use the tangent handles and the anchor points in here just, for me, is very, very awkward. If I'm going to do any extensive work in here with this, it's easier just for me to work in Illustrator. But I want to show you that it, it, it is doable. So how do we avoid what happened with the selection mesh? I'll double click. It erases the stage. And now I'm going to go back to the ellipse tool once again. This time I'm going to select object drawing instead. Now I can click and drag. <coughs> um, similar to other programs, if you want to constrain proportions, hold down the shift key. That will make it a perfect circle. If you don't, then it makes it ellipse. The same with if you make a, a, the rectangle tool. And again, a rectangle, hold down the shift key, it makes it a perfect square. Okay. And now watch. When I select this one, you'll notice that there's a little bounding box around it. You don't see the selection mesh anymore. That lets you know that that bounding box, that this is an object. It also tells you in the properties panel, this is draw object drawing. So now, if I select this one, you'll see that this is also a rectangular primitive. And now when I overlap these and I deselect, and I select one again, and I move it, they remain independent of one another. So it is a unique way of working. If you've, if you've worked with Illustrator, if you've worked with Photoshop, it's really kind of a combination of the two. <coughs> now, um, there's lots of things that I can cover in here. It depends. I mean, you'll see how we can make arcs. You know, when I, when I created this tool, let me come back here for a minute. Let me just select the regular rectangle tool, and I click and I drag. Um, if I hit the up key, notice it makes a negative corner arc. If I hit the down key, you'll notice that it increases the radius around the corners. You can also specify the settings here when we select. And we select, let's say, rectangle primitive tool. And we have these, ob these settings here. So look at the settings in the properties panel. And you'll see that we have lots of options. If you want radial corners, or you want to put in a specific size of line weight, or I can select this, for example, any one of these. And you'll see that the, the line is a solid line. Or what if I want to change it to one that's a kind of a, a funky kind of stroke? or a dotted line. You can always, just like Illustrator, you can change all of these properties at any time. Or you can remove the properties. I can decide I don't want <coughs> stroke color. I don't want any at all. I can go ahead and click None, and it goes away. Or if I want the fill, it can go away. So on this one, if I select that, I can specify this, the fill and select None, and I just have an outline. So for each shape you create, it has two properties. It has a fill and a stroke. They can manipul be manipulated independent of one another. And depending on what you choose, whether it be a shape object or you select the drawing object, will determine how they interact or they don't interact with one another. There is another way around that, too. That later on, if you decide that I want this to behave like a shape object, I can, if I double click on this, whoops, uh, okay, I have to convert it to, uh, never mind. This is a drawing object now. And you'll notice that these other shapes grayed out. Now when I select it, notice it's a selection mesh. Notice up here, it's n I'm no longer in that primitive or I'm no longer with that drawing object, I'm inside it. 
is a, it's a container. And this will be a hard concept for some of you to follow. But notice how this is grayed out. And when I come back here and I deselect and I go back, hold on here. Why can't I do this? Um, oh, wait a minute. That's why I got to move this. There we go. Go back to the scene. And now I see them all by themselves. But if I double click on any one of them, notice that the other two are grayed out and I no longer see that outline anymore. I see the selection mesh. So if you accidentally double click on these, notice that the behavior may change. And when we get to symbols, that will be especially true. That you'll want to go, because symbols are like containers, like um, you know, the little nested Russian dolls, you know, one inside another, inside another. That's really how this works. Even though we were working with a shape, a drawing object, inside that drawing object is actually a shape object. We just applied a, a behavior to that. And then I go back to scene and it takes me back to where I was. <coughs> okay. Sort of makes sense? Okay. Well, that will be true for these other shapes, rectangle, over, oval, polystar tool. If I select that, you'll notice down here, um, again, I can select options, and I can determine that I want a polygon, the number of sides, or do I want a star, number of sides, five, six, seven. When I click and I drag, notice that it's five, but if I use the up arrow, whoops, Oh, come on. Why aren't you working? I guess I do have to change it on the fly. Maybe, why isn't it doing it? In the past, it would allow me to hit the up or the down key to add or subtract, and it's not allowing that, huh? Okay, so we select it here, and we go to options, and we change it from here. I don't know why that's not allowing that. There's something wonky going on. So I could change it if I want a six-sided star, just hit six or seven, whatever. Click OK, now click and notice I have seven. OK. If you'd like, um, I know it's already started, but because um, I started late. Would you guys like to continue, or do you want to watch the inauguration? I'll take, take a vote. And we can come back to this when the inauguration's over. It's up to all of you. Hmm? You got to go? So your vote doesn't count. <laughs> Anybody else? Huh? I can't hear. Huh? Just play with the tools um, because what we're doing right now is just getting you up to speed so we can do a, a, a simple animation, anim linear animation. But we have, and have to make sure that you know how to use the tools and we have to then know how to do tweens so that you can do the animations and then we'll do a little add. Um, I hope to get to that, yeah, on Thursday. I was told that they were going to install CS4 computer by computer, and I guess they haven't done anything yet, so I don't know, maybe they've changed their mind. Every day I talk to them, they change their mind. So, and I told them that half the class, you know, my class is, especially my Photoshop class, they've already purchased the CS4 book, so you have to do it. And if we transition, you know, if the transition is over a week or two or something, that's the way it goes, but we already talked about it. So, so does anybody, do you want to, do you want to watch the inauguration or you want to just keep going? Okay, wait, once again, the inauguration, okay, how about, how many of you want to just keep going? Okay, then you guys have it. If you guys want to watch the inauguration on your screen, you can. If you go to, um, hold on here. 
I have it on my computer. Not that I'm watching it, uh, just that I saved it last night. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I have that. Um, wanted to let you know where that is. It's, um, if you go to um, www.ustream.tv. Oh, shoot. Movie clip. Hang on here. This is a container We've got something else movie. going on my movie computer here. Layers, frames, and even whole animations. Further, the animations stored in the movie clip play independently of the main timeline, meaning you don't have to extend the timeline to accommodate the animation like you do with a graphic symbol. That ends that. Okay. So where do I have it? It's um, Link Live. It says off the air. So why is that? Inaugural webcast. It should be going now. Oh, let me log in. Maybe you have to sign up and log in. I didn't know that you did. Let's go to live. If you go to ustreamtv.com, it should be. This is live Barack Obama, CNN. There's a whole bunch of them that you should be able to watch live if you want to do that. And just click on it, and it should have the, yeah, it should have it live so you can watch it. It's fine. Um, no offense. Some of you do that anyway. You play games and do other stuff while I'm lecturing, so <laughs> not as good a time as any. Okay. Okay, so let's cover some other tools. <coughs> um, paintbrush is a good tool. Well, pencil is just what you might think. You know, I click and I drag, and because I had this stroke type selected, um, you'll see that it's a black stroke, clearly no fill, and it's a six-point rule. But with it selected, remember, I can always change the, the thickness from here reduce the thickness. I can also change the stroke color from here. You can always change it. Okay. <coughs> There's also another nice feature. And it, I don't know. You know, I say it's nice, but I never use it. So in the pencil mode, you notice down here, we have straighten, smooth, and ink. So I'm going to select straighten and watch what happens. I'm going to try. I'm going to switch from the um, little funky kind of stroke here to a solid line, and I want something a little bit smaller, maybe a one-point stroke. And I'm going to switch back to black. And I'm going to with. I'm left-handed, by the way, and I use my mouse with the right hand. So when I try to draw, <coughs> it really comes out horrible. Why I use my mouse with my right hand when I'm left-handed, I don't know. But now watch. I'm gonna, it says straighten. I'm going to try to draw a circle. And it doesn't look terribly good, does it? But when I let go of the mouse, it knows that I'm trying to draw a circle, and it makes a perfect circle. Similarly, if I try to make a square or a rectangle, that doesn't look ter this isn't looking terribly good, does it? But look at that. It knows that I'm trying to draw a square or a rectangle, and it, it straightens it out and makes it for me. Why you wouldn't just want to use the rectangle tool, I don't know, but that's how it works. <coughs> you can also come down here and with the, uh, the pencil tool selected again, instead of straighten, we can select smooth. And what it does is just what you might think. It's going, it's not going to make a perfect circle, but instead of being all jaggy like this, it is going to try to smooth it out. Okay, so it, it's somewhere in between. It's not as crude as I had drawn, but it's a little bit neater. <coughs> and then the last one, the ink, is it draws just what you do. It's just as if it's crude, it leaves it crude. It doesn't smooth it out, it doesn't straighten it, so you have your choice. The brush tool is pretty cool. 
Um, it, it, you can do some fun things with it. Again, we have the brush size below here. So always pay attention to what you have below. We have brush size, I have the largest one selected, and we have brush shapes. And I'm just going to use the, um, the round tool. And we have is our pink as our fill, so I'm going to just make some squiggly kinds of gibberish kind of squiggle stuff. Now I'm going to come back and I'm going to select a different fill color, maybe green, and I'll draw over here. Whoops, I shouldn't have had that selected. Okay, and let's deselect that, and then let's select another color. Let's go back to, let's have that orange, whoops. Like so. Now these are all separate, right? <coughs> because I used this function down here when I was selecting them. Um, here's a brush. That it w I was using the object drawing. Okay. Now I also have another tool when I select this. So I'm going to turn this off. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. And it's right here. It's similar to that eraser mode. It says paint normal. I can paint fills, I can paint behind, or I can paint selection. So, or paint inside. So if I select paint inside, let's start at the bottom. And I click out here. It didn't do a thing. Let me um. I'm gonna do, let me try something a little bit different. I'm gonna go back with the um. The brush tool, and I'm gonna turn off. Come on. I don't want that on. Why are you doing that? Maybe it does it by default now, huh? I guess that's the only way it will work. Okay, I should let me just go back a couple of steps. Let's bring it back up. <coughs> so now when I select the brush tool again, huh? Well, we can lock fills if you want. That's another nice feature. Um, let's try again. I'm going to say that we've had paint normal selected, paint fills. So if I click in here. And let's select here. It didn't work. So maybe if I select, that, but that's paint selected. So with that selected and I select the brush again and I paint across, it didn't do a thing. So why won't it do it? Let me go ahead and here and let's paint. Oh, Pasha. I'm having trouble too. Why is that the case? Let me er erase everything again. Let's select the brush tool. For the life of me, I can't figure out why that is locked. Because if I have paint fill paint normal selected. Okay, I'm making it like so. I'm going to go ahead and go to Modify, and I'm going to select Break Apart, and you'll see that it's um, just a selection mesh. And now, if I deselect this, and I use the Brush tool again, and I select from our selection mode here, Paint Fills, if I click outside and across, uh, it's just going to do that. What am I doing here? Let me select a different color. Select red. Click and drag. That won't work. If I click inside and then go out, it's not working either. Paint behind. Let me try that. There we go. That's working properly. If I select this again, paint selection, obviously, if I just have a selection, and I, even if I paint outside, it will, um, if I click out here, it will only paint in the selection. So that's kind of cool. 
So that's what these guys do, and I'm not getting all of them to work properly. This paint fills, paint behind. I got most of them to work, paint inside. Okay. So that's what that does. Now, something else that you sh I should caution you about, if I use the stroke tool, and I make a vertical stroke, and then I make a vertical stroke here, and I deselect them. <coughs> Remember I said if they were the same color and they were overlapped, they would join, wouldn't they? That's not how it works with this. If I select this, actually it is working that way. In the past it didn't. So maybe because I had under stroke, that's right, I had that one, I had the shape object selected. But watch what happens if, I, if the shape object, or rather the drawing object is not selected. Watch what happens. And now I'm going to come back and I'm going to select this. Notice that it's a separate piece. When I select it, just when I just click on it once, it, now this, because there's nothing touching it, is one piece. So let me undo this for a minute. Let's go back. If I want to select the whole thing, I have to double click on it. And now the whole thing is selected and allows me to move it. Strange, huh? If I just select it once, it sees it as a separate shape, even though it's the same color. So similarly, if I select, again, let's use the rectangle tool, and I have drawing object turned off, and I select, click and drag. You'll notice that when I select it, I see the selection mesh. When I move outside and I click once, notice that it, when I selected the edge and I selected once, I selected just the piece. So it sees it as a multiple parts. If I, do, if I move to the edge and I double click on the edge, I've only selected the path. If I move inside and I select the mesh, I've only selected the mesh by clicking once. If I want both the stroke and the fill selected, I have to move inside and double click. Now I have them both selected. That's why you're probably going to want, when you do create a shape, that you're going to want it to be an object, a drawing object when you create it, so you don't have to worry about that. And if you do want to change it, double click on it and you will go inside that object and it will allow you to edit it. Does that make sense to everybody? Sort of? Yes? No? Let me see where I am <coughs> with my um, time here, with my video, and then what might be a good time to do is to take a break, and then what we can do is have you tinker with these for a while. Because what I want to do on Thursday is to jump right into animation. We'll do frame-by-frame -frame animation work with onion skinning, we will edit multiple frames, and then probably by next Tuesday, we'll do tween animation. We'll actually start with shape tweens. It depends on how quickly we can go. <coughs> um, hold on. There's still a couple more things that I should probably discuss today. Let me see where I am on time. Uh, I have 14 minutes left, so on my video recorder. So what I can show you is that if you do want to select a fill or a stroke and you want to change the color, it can be done from the properties panel. It can also be done, you'll notice, or if you ha maybe you haven't noticed, that we have the color panel here. If you don't see that, go to Window, and you should see it down here, Color, and that will bring it up. We also have swatches here, and that can be visible. You'll notice that these are tog uh, can toggle back and forth, and I can click and drag to keep these separate from one another. 
On another day, we will get to gradients. And you can also animate gradients, too, which is pretty cool. But if I have that selected, and one of the things that we can change that you will change frequently will be the alpha. Does everybody know what alpha is? Anybody not know what alpha is? Alpha is the transparency. So if I want this to be a transparent fill, I can click from here, and I can make it, for example, a 50% transparent. Now, it looks the same while it's selected, but when I deselect, it just looks sort of like a salmon color. But if I double click on this and I move it up and I deselect, notice that you can see through it now. So that's one of the things that you will change often. And the, the place to do that would be from your color panel here to change the alpha. You can't, excuse me, you can put in RGB settings. <coughs> which gives you, you know, millions of colors. My recommendation for any solid colors you use is to stick with, with, with the, the, um, the web safe colors that you're given here. If I want to double click on this and I want it to be a gradient fill, I can do that. Notice that I have some preset gradients. I can also create my own. And you'll notice with this gradient selected, we can come in here and I can, um, we'll talk about gradients more, but I can click here and I can um, click on this tab and we can make this a green in the middle. And you can change this however you like. And I can click in here and I can add that to my palette. So now I have that as an additional gradient available to me. So there's lots of these things to draw with, to fill with, to we can change and edit in any, you know, any way we like. This happens to be a radio fill, but I can turn it into a linear fill. You know, there's all sorts of stuff we can do. Now, what if I decide, because I did not create a, a, a drawing object with this, I don't want this to interact with anything, do I? Any, I, I, well, I'd say I don't want it to interact any, with anything. How can I convert this and protect it so it, it, uh, it, when it overlaps something, there isn't a problem? You can always turn it into a group. And it looks very similar to a drawing object. So just hit Command-G or go to um, Modify Group. And when it's converted to a group, you'll see a little blue outline. You see the little blue outline? And that blue outline lets you know that it's a group. But again, what if you want it to behave like a shape object, similar to the drawing object? If I double click on this, watch what happens. I double click, and look what happens here. I'm no longer in the scene. I'm in something called a group. Now with it selected, I see the selection mesh. And when I come over the edge, you know, when I deselect and I come over the edge, I can edit it this way. I can edit it, you know, I can do all kinds of weird things to this. Okay. And then when I'm done with it, so that it behaves like a group or a drawing object, I click back here where it says scene. Now I'm back and I have it and it's in and it's it's whole again, and it doesn't interact with any other shape. Okay. Do those, does that sort of make sense, or is it, does it get overwhelming a little bit? Because it's similar to Illustrator, and it's different. It's similar to Photoshop, and it's different. And yet, when we select these, if I want to edit this, I can select this, which is the free transform tool. And you'll notice I, I can stretch these. I can move over the, the edge here and I can rotate. I can, you know, squish them. And then there's even another feature in here. What if, I, I mean, I can always come back and with the direct selection tool, I can select the edge when I, on the inside here. Let me, let me go inside this. Let's go inside the shape. Come on. There we go. Let's select the direct selection tool. You can see the individual anchor points that you can, and tangent handles that you can 
manipulate. In addition to that, though, if I come back to here with the, <coughs> um, the free transform tool, there's also one here under modify, um, transform, and I can use envelope. Envelope is strange. I can click here, and notice how this begins to sh change these other properties. Notice it's only changing the fill and not the stroke because I goofed. I only selected one and not the other. So I have them both selected now. And now when I go to modify and I go to transform and I select envelope, it brings up a free transform box, but it does something very different. When you look at these little anchor points here, with the can they're actually tangent handles. Notice how it's distorting the shape inside. And then when I'm done, I go back to my scene and I have a transformed shape. So you can start with a very simple geometric shape and when you're done, come up with something totally different. And depending on what tools feel comfortable to you, you can utilize the tools that are available in Flash and use it kind of like a cookie cutter or they can be added together. Or if this is overwhelming, then forget it. And, and, and I literally mean that, just it doesn't matter. If you feel more comfortable drawing in Photoshop or you know painting in Photoshop and bringing in that image, that's fine. And the same with Illustrator. Illustrator, I feel, has much better drawing tools. And maybe that's because I used Illustrator earlier on and it just it becomes second nature to you. So, you know, and you can export them as S SWF files, op you know, import them into Flash. It will retain all of its properties and you can manipulate it, do whatever you want with it. Okay. I'm sure I'm s forgetting something, but I'm also running out of video time and I do want to take a brief break and think about it and then maybe come back and do some more or just leave it for Thursday. Because I would like you to spend some time and get it getting acclimated to the layout and just using the, the draw and paint tools and tinker with them. And remember that you do have to select, the, if you don't want them to interact, that you have to select that it is a, uh, a draw object. Or if you do want them to inter interact, then make sure that that's turned off. And if you forget, remember to double click and then you go inside that container so that you can manipulate it there. Because even though this is a group, when I double click on it, and it takes me inside that group, I can now actually take something like so and I can combine this. Actually, let me go back to a solid fill. And let's go back here. And I'm going to use this to fill that. Okay, so now when I select these, these are still separate. Let me take the stroke away. Okay, notice that I'm inside the group. And I've changed its properties dramatically, haven't I? And using the properties of a, a shape object with a selection mesh. And now I go back to the scene and it still sees this as a group. So I transformed it inside that container. So even though it, it behaves as a group here, when you're inside the group, it behaves as a um, a shape object and we can transform it in the ways that shape objects can be transformed. <coughs> yeah, hold on. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off and then we'll revise some of those. Sure. 